On July 4th, 1998, in Midland, Texas, a surrogate mother, 33-year-old Lainey Thomas, was startled awake in the early morning hours to find five people surrounding her bed, her husband lying next to her with his throat slit. What happened and what she found out later was an absolute nightmare. The following accounts were told by Lainey to the police after that fateful night. I remember when I first decided I wanted to be a surrogate mother. I thought it would be a wonderful experience and I'd get to help a couple in the process. I never thought it would become the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I was due to give birth in three to four weeks and everything had been going well with the pregnancy. I was awakened at 5.33 a.m. early that morning. I remember the exact time because when I opened my eyes, I was staring at the red numbers on the digital clock that sits on my nightstand. I then noticed two people standing close to my bed and another one at the foot of my bed. I screamed out and turned over to Rob. It was then I noticed the dark pool of what I assumed was blood on the bed. Rob's throat had been sliced open. His eyes were wide open and he had a look of horror on his face I shall never forget. I could see there were two more people on Rob's side of the bed. One of them then flipped on the lamp that sits on Rob's nightstand. As I laid there screaming, they grabbed my arms and legs holding me down. The person at the end of the bed then reached down to grab something. I could see he was wielding a large knife as he climbed onto the bed. While this was happening, one of them was speaking in what I guessed was an Eastern European language as all of them were Caucasian and two of the men were blonde. The man with the knife then ripped the blanket off of me and lifted up my nightgown. He looked over at the man that was holding my left arm and said something. The man nodded back, letting the man with the knife know to proceed from what I'd guessed. He then stuck the pointed end of the knife into the left side of my belly and started slicing along as I shrieked out in pain. Once he was done cutting me open, he reached inside, grabbed a hold of the baby, and pulled him out. He then shouted something as he held the baby high in the air. He then gently set the baby down on the bed and cut the umbilical cord. At that point, I was almost ready to pass out from the pain, but sudden and loud knocking on the front door startled me, and I came to. It was then I remembered it had to be Rob's co-worker and friend, Chase. He picks Rob up every morning to go to work, and he probably thought Rob slept in. I screamed at the top of my lungs, Chase, Chase, help me. Laney, is that you? Are you all right? He shouted back. No, help me. I shrieked as loud as I could. I could then hear Chase kicking on the door trying to break it open. It wasn't long before I heard the door swing open, hitting the wall with a loud thud. I then heard him running through the house towards our bedroom. As this was happening, the men in my room were speaking fast in a panicked tone, getting ready to leave. They quickly and carefully put the baby in some type of container, closing the lid with the baby inside. Chase, be careful. There's five men in here. Call the police, I shouted. Chase is a big guy, 6'5 and very muscular, and I knew he wouldn't hesitate to fight to protect me. Not long after I'd said that, he came storming into the room and started swinging at the closest person to him. The man he hit fell to the floor in a heap. Two other men pounced on him and they started fighting. While that was happening, the man holding the container with the baby quickly ran around them and out of the room along with one of the other men. Chase managed to beat off the two men who were attacking him, and as he did, they quickly fled the room. This left only the man Chase managed to knock out. Chase ran over to me, and with a sound of horror in his voice said, What the hell is going on? Who were those people? I don't know. They cut the baby out of me. Call an ambulance. I need help, I replied. He quickly went to the kitchen and called the police. When he came back into the room, he'd grab some towels putting them on my belly where they'd cut the baby out. I don't remember much after that. All I know is that my sweet husband is gone. I'll never see his beautiful smile again, and the baby that grew in my womb was cut, ripped, and taken from me. Lainey was barely alive when the ambulance arrived, almost dying due to loss of blood. If Chase hadn't shown up when he did, she'd most certainly be dead. The following accounts were told by the man Chase knocked out. He referred to himself as Vladimir, but would give no further details about himself. 
After putting towels on Lainey's belly to try and stop the bleeding, Chase went over to the man on the floor and tied him up. Vladimir did not speak English, and it was finally determined the language he spoke was Estonian. A translator was flown in and interviewed him. This is their conversation as it's been transcribed to English. Hi, my name is Endrick. I've been sent here to ask you some questions. What's your name? My name is Vladimir. Where are you from, Vladimir? It does not matter where I'm from. The only thing that matters is we completed the task we were given. What task is that? I'm going to tell you a dark tale of a young boy and his journey through something special. This boy lived on the streets of Estonia for several years, being he had no family. Sometimes he was passed around from one family to the next until he was eight years of age, at which point he was sent to an orphanage. He remained there for two years when one day in walked what appeared to be a nice married couple. They said they were looking to adopt a boy between the ages of nine to eleven, but that a boy who was about to turn nine would also do. They talked to all of the boys in that age group before deciding to adopt this particular boy. Two weeks later they came back to pick up the boy. He thought they wouldn't come back, so when they did, he got excited about the possibility of being with a family. They'd driven for about 30 minutes before pulling the car over to the side of the road. The couple then got out of the car and into the back seat with the boy. They looked at the boy, then started speaking in a language he didn't understand. As they were talking, the man reached into his coat pocket, pulling out a bottle of something. He grabbed the boy by his hair, pulling his head back, then forced him to drink from the bottle. Whatever was in the bottle tasted awful. The smell of manure woke the boy as he struggled to open his eyes. When he was able to see well enough, he could see the couple standing over him. It was cold, and judging by the smell and his surroundings, he assumed he was in a barn. Right then, he heard the sound of squeaking as he looked over and saw what appeared to be an old man in a wheelchair being pushed by someone. Once the old man reached the table, the boy was on. The old man put up his hand, indicating to stop. The boy looked over into the old man's eyes as he glared back. Minutes went by as the old man said nothing, simply staring at the boy. This one will join us, said the old man. He then raised his hand and the person behind him wheeled him out of sight. As the boy lay there scared and confused, he was somewhat intrigued as to what was happening. The couple then released the restraints on his arms and his legs. As the boy sat up, the man who the boy knew as Marco looked him straight in the eyes and said, you are privileged to be blessed with what you're about to be given. Marco then grabbed the boy by the arm, pulled him off the table, and led him to a small room in the barn. It starts tomorrow, said Marco as he closed and locked the door. The boy spent the night in that cold, dark room, wondering what was going to happen next, wondering if his life was about to be cut short. The following morning, he was suddenly yanked out of bed and dragged to another room in the barn. He was then tied to a chair, and there he sat for a while before someone came into the room and sat across from him. That person was a middle-aged man who looked like he'd been to hell and back. His face was covered in scars, and his eyes looked dead. He then told the boy a story that was not only unbelievable, but frightening. We've been around a long time. If I told you how long, you wouldn't believe me. You've been chosen to serve with us. We call ourselves feeders. We feed the Ancient One, the one you saw in the wheelchair, the hearts of children, and in return he gives us immortality. Most of us here are his children by blood. Only a few of you are spared and allowed to become feeders alongside us. Why? We do not know. Only the Ancient One, our Father, knows. The Ancient One is very specific about the children he wants to eat the hearts of. They must be from a certain type of child which you will learn. When Marco and Anna met you, you had the criteria, but like I said, for some reason he spared your life. As time passes, the age of the children his appetite seems to require is becoming younger. You will learn the ways of the Ancient One, eventually becoming one of us. Over the next ten years, the boy was schooled and trained to become a feeder, until he reached the age of eighteen, which is when his first taking would take place. Over many years, we've moved from country to country to avoid being caught by the authorities. When we go take a child for the Ancient One, we also travel long distances. 
We've learned to have specific targets chosen months or longer ahead of time using modern day methods such as surrogates and certain orphanages. By setting up and using surrogates, we've learned we can create exactly what the Ancient One's appetite desires. The Ancient One has been most pleased with this approach, and I see it becoming our most sought after method. The boy was in an unspecified part of Europe when his first taking took place. When it's a feeder's first time, he gets the honor of taking the child or removing the child from the mother's womb, depending on what the Ancient One has requested. In this instance, the Ancient One requested a baby from the womb. I was there when the boy had the honor of his first taking, being I trained him for years. I vividly remember as I picked the lock on the door to go inside and looked over at the boy. He was trembling and obviously scared. I whispered to him to calm down. Once I had unlocked the door, the five of us slowly crept inside the house of the couple we'd been targeting for months. As we entered the house, we could hear the sound of running water in a sink somewhere near the couple's bedroom, meaning someone was awake. We knew this as we spent time casing the house long before we entered it. When someone is awake, when we enter a house, one person is tasked with proceeding to take care of the problem while the others wait. It was my turn that night. As I crept through the house, I was cautious as you never know what's going to happen. As I approached the bathroom, I drew my knife from its sheath. When I turned the corner, there before me stood the husband. I quickly lunged forward, aiming for his solar plexus. I hit directly where I was aiming. At that point, my training took over and I proceeded to stab him repeatedly until there was no more breath in him. As I stood up, I noticed the pregnant wife was now in a full state of panic. I yelled out to the others to come quickly and restrain her, to which they did. When I came over to my position, which would be her left side arm, which was where the boy was at, I nodded to him to proceed and do what needs to be done. He paused, looking at me for a bit, before taking his position at the end of the bed and grabbing the knife we used to slice open the womb and remove the baby inside. The person doing the cutting and removal must always get permission from the group's leader before starting. I'll never forget the look in his eyes as he looked at me waiting for my nod of approval. He had a look of anger and hatred in his eyes like I've never seen before. It was then I knew he would make a great feeder for the family. Where is the boy now? asked the interviewer. I don't know, and if I did, I wouldn't say. He was with me the night I got captured, replied Vladimir. Vladimir then refused to talk any more and would not disclose any locations or further details about the family. He then spent a year in a Texas jail. One day, two government officials from Estonia showed up and said he was to be deported back to Estonia, where he'd be questioned and imprisoned. His true identity was never discovered. When Lainey Thomas was told what Vladimir said, her response was, Looking back at the surrogate couple, Dana and Mark, they did seem off to me. Sometimes I felt as if they were too nice, almost like it was a project they were working on for drama class. For more scary horror stories, please subscribe.